Today we're going to test out various fire positions for the Baker rifle, as found in contemporary texts of the early 1800s. The nature of soldiering performed by the 95th Rifles and other light infantry units demanded that the men be exercised in and familiar with a range of firing positions according to the ground they found themselves operating in. To today's soldier, these positions are somewhat of a non-issue, but to the infantry of the early 1800s, they were the preserve of the light bulbs. We'll examine some of these positions as found in period artwork. The most comprehensive image I have found is this one showing the standing, kneeling, sitting, prone, and supine positions. I also drew on the book 23 Years Practice and Observations with Rifle Guns by the man himself, Ezekiel Baker. Using this artwork and supporting documentation, I'll attempt to recreate these positions and provide some comment as to their effectiveness. The Standing Position As a form of control experiment, I elected to go first with the standing unsupported. The salient points of this position are the fact that the rifle is supported completely with the muscle of the left and right arms. It does have the advantage, however, of being very quick to adopt. The next example is somewhat peculiar in that the sling is looped underneath the left elbow with the left forearm braced under the forestock. My initial thoughts were that this position was not going to be particularly effective. I was to find out through practice that it did provide some degree of stability. The benefit I did find was that the left arm sling and rifle became one unit and therefore the position was slightly more stable. I did find, however, that due to the adjustment size of my sling, bracing the left forearm underneath the forestock was somewhat problematic and having to straighten the wrist, which led to instability. I decided to shorten the sling length by some six or eight inches. This I found to be most effective in creating a more stable and more easily adopted fire position. As noted here, the smaller sling length enabled my arm to wedge itself more effectively and comfortably underneath the forestock. This made the position more comfortable and less fatiguing. The next variation of the standing position was based on this piece of artwork. While more of a stylization of a rifleman of the era, rather than an actual example, it does provide an interesting example of a standing position. This variation has one particular key feature that factors importantly in accuracy from the standing position. The fact that the elbow is held close to the body with the bone of the left forearm supporting the weight of the rifle is important in providing maximum stability. The variation whereby the thumb and the finger are used to support the rifle is better substituted by this version with the hand placed flat underneath the forestock. The point is illustrated well by this demonstration. Here, the left arm uses muscle to support the rifle, whereas here, the left arm is held close to the body and the bone of the left forearm supports the weight. This version is in fact more stable for accurate shooting from the standing position. As a way to bring the analysis of positions full circle, I elected to demonstrate the use of a more modern technique. Here, the sling is wrapped up into the left armpit with the left wrist placed in front of it. This method has the benefit of the previous two demonstrated. One, the sling is used to help support and create a bond with the arm, creating stability. And two, the elbow is held close to the body, providing that bone support versus that of straight muscle. With practice and a properly adjusted sling, this is a most effective standing position for longer range, non-snap shooting applications. Of course, as is mentioned in period texts, the standing position is not the best for overall accuracy. It does, however, provide 
the firer the advantage of shooting over cover, as is demonstrated here. The kneeling position. Period writings indicate that this position was more desirable and should be used whenever possible. It gave the firer an intermediate position between the unstable standing position and the slow to adopt prone or supine. Loading could also be achieved without the difficulty of the prone evolution, and in fact with not much more difficulty than in the standing. In my experiments there was one aspect of this position, as shown in the artwork, that I found very difficult to incorporate. All of the artwork illustrated the firer with his body forward off of the right heel. In practice, this is not stable, comfortable, or easily adopted by me. Typically, I adopt a position as illustrated here. This upright position is at odds with a more conventional sitting on the heel version or even sitting on the foot. There are aspects of the artwork that bear mention. The position of the left elbow resting with its back on top of the knee, with the leg and the arm as close to being in line as possible is well illustrated. Here I demonstrate a version of the kneeling position where the body is raised off of the elbow and knee. Not only is this type of kneeling position inherently unstable, as unstable in fact as the standing position, but I also could not find a single example of any artwork depicting this style of kneeling position. The sitting position. This little known position appears in this period artwork. This version is quite conventional in nature, and although it provides good support for both elbows, it suffers from a difficulty of adoption. Perhaps the most awkward feature of this position is the almost bionic strength required to get out of it. The prone position. A key feature in all period artwork is the use of the prone supported position. In this version, the shako is almost ubiquitously used to support the forend of the rifle. This is a good field expedient method as every soldier would have had one. But for purposes of the experiment, I'll go first with the unsupported version. Here, the rifle is only supported by the arms. Overall, the position is readily adopted, though loading from the prone position by rolling onto one's back can be a little bit difficult at times. Though stable, it's not as stable as using the prone supported position. I don't have a shackle, but what I've done is used my aiming rest to mimic the placement of the piece of headgear underneath the forend of the rifle. This helps greatly steady the rifle and make your shot all the better. I thought I'd make mention of the three different positions one can place the rest. The first, under the hand, the second, under the forestock slightly in front of the hand, and the third, right out at the end of the forestock, much like a modern bipod. It's important to note that each of these positions will change the point of impact to some degree. It's worth noting that the body position specifically isn't talked about in any of the texts that I read, but the illustrations seem to indicate that the body was placed straight behind the rifle. The more modern versions have the body angled behind the weapon, and either the legs placed flat on the ground, or the right leg hooked. To modern shooters, the supine position may seem somewhat arcane, but its use was widespread in the 19th century, and continues to this day in the long-range black powder community. There are a number of versions shown in artwork, the first of which we'll deal with is the use of the sling to support the rifle. The foot placed inside the sling and the hands pulling back at the wrist of the stock an effect much like the bracing of a biplane's wing is achieved. For safety, the sling must be shortened so that the muzzle protrudes past the sole of the foot. The hands are then free to pull back at the wrist of the stock and aid in the alignment of the sights. To this end, the feet can also be used to adjust the elevation of the barrel. 
with high, medium, and low positions. Overall, I found this version of the supine position to be somewhat difficult to adopt with the pushing and pulling aspect fatiguing the body. The use of other methods proved to be more suitable. Using the left leg to support the rifle was one such method. Though not a piece of period artwork, it did serve to demonstrate the use of the left leg. With the left leg bent and the foot hooked through the sling, the butt was able to be placed in the shoulder, providing more support and steadiness in aiming. But it was the use of the right leg to support the rifle as illustrated here, showing the rifleman Tom Plunkett, whereby he shot a French general in perhaps the most famous feat of Baker marksmanship. As you can see here, great pains were taken to make sure that my feet were out of the way in all three versions of the supine position. It was the easiest by far to achieve that level of safety, as well as comfort and support of the rifle using this right leg method. One thing that modern target shooters don't have to contend with when using the supine position is the wearing of infantry equipment. This proved to be an embuggerance of the highest degree, with the pouch having to be brought forward onto the right hip and the powder horn moved to the rear behind the back, safely out of the way of any pan ignition. Subsequent to that, the cartridge box needed to be tilted to allow room for the stock and its position in the shoulder. This position, while effective, requires good practice. But because of its awkwardness, I don't think that it would be chosen over a good, prone, supported version. As mentioned in many works, riflemen of the era were encouraged to one, know their weapons inside and out, load them in the most effective way possible and due to the nature of their work that being light infantry they would have been free to adopt these positions as they saw fit as usual thanks for watching